Oh, somebody else already hit record, huh? So we're good there. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's seminar on offshore wind energy as part of our Earth Day Everyday Seminar Series. Uh, I'm Doug Zemeckis, a Marine Extension Agent with Rutgers Cooperative Extension. Uh, tonight is uh, seminar five of six of our spring series, uh, focusing in on the elements of natural resource management, uh, a science-based educational programming uh, seminar series as part of Rutgers Cooperative Extension. It's a mashup collaboration between our Earth Day Everyday program and our Marine Extension program seminar series, MEPS. Uh, we have a team of uh, extension agents with Rutgers Cooperative Extension collaborating to bring this science-based programming to you via webinar. We are covering a, a mixture of terrestrial and marine topics uh, and looking at the elements of natural resource management. Tonight is marine and we're focusing in on air and talking about offshore wind energy. We have Chris Olith from the Special Initiative on Offshore Wind as our featured speaker tonight. Some navigational aids for tonight's webinar. We're scheduled for one hour. Uh, we expect about a 40 minute presentation and then Q&A afterwards. I'll be serving as the moderator during the Q&A period. Uh, please put any questions that you have for Chris uh, into the Q&A feature. I'll organize them and get through as many as we can at the end of her presentation. A uh, very important, timely subject tonight of offshore wind off the coast of New Jersey. Uh, very important ec environmentally, economically, uh, and energy system-wise wise to the state of New Jersey and beyond. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, uh, interest and passion in this subject and varying opinions on it. But tonight, this is a science-based educational program. I'm going to be focusing on the questions that are science-based, constructive, and respectful as we uh, learn about offshore wind energy from Chris this evening. Next slide, please, Chris. Uh, so at the end of tonight's seminar, uh, uh, right before the Q&A, there'll be a poll put into the, uh, that'll pop up on your screen as part of this Zoom webinar. That's a program evaluation to get your feedback on this program. So that way we can improve our Earth Day every day and our other natural resource uh, extension programs to bring you science-based uh, educational programming. Uh, that survey uh, is considered uh, research in the eyes of our institutional review board and the human subjects providing your input on that program evaluation. There'll be a, a consent question in the beginning uh, that you consent to participate and provide your feedback on the program evaluation. Next slide, please, Chris. And uh, Rutgers Cooperative Extension, we are an equal opportunity employer and also program provider, uh, striving to provide our programs without discrimination and to as many people as possible, including this Earth Day Everyday uh, webinar series uh, with live webinars right now. And we're recording it to make and post it up on our Rutgers NJAES New Jersey Ag Experiment Station uh, YouTube page for future viewing by as many people as possible. Next slide, please, Chris. Uh, with that, I'd like to formally welcome and introduce our featured speaker tonight, uh, Chris Olith. She's coming back to us here. She presented for the MEPS seminar series in those uh, providing a bright spot on the dark days of April 2020 when we were in early stages of COVID lockdown. I still remember that, Chris. So looking forward to hearing all your updates uh, just over four years later. Uh, since 2021, Chris has been serving as the director of the Special Initiative on Offshore Wind. She's worked in the offshore wind sector for more than 20 years. Uh, so pause and think about that. As many of us are just learning and hearing about this, uh, she's been spending more than two decades working on offshore wind-related issues. With the Special Initiative on Offshore Wind, she leads the organization uh, to develop and implement strategies that support responsible development of offshore wind energy. Uh, she's got a bachelor's degree in journalism and communication from Rutgers, so uh, also an alumni. Great to have you contribute to our extension program. Uh, a master's in ocean and coastal policy from University of Rhode Island. Uh, she's worked in a variety of environmental and fisheries capacities, and also uh, notably as the director of MARCO, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean, as well as uh, for offshore wind developers such as Orsted, before taking this role as the director of the Special Initiative on Offshore Wind. 
So a true expert on offshore wind, it's a real appreciate, much appreciated and honored to have you join us again, Chris, uh, to cover this really important critical topic on natural resource management for the state of New Jersey. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Doug, and so, so delightful to be with you again. I can't believe it's been four years. I mean, wow, the the COVID, the COVID time was just uh, just insane. So grateful to be back. I uh, and I, I did want to let you know I would have gone to Rutgers for my master's degree if Rutgers had an ocean and coastal policy program, but they do not. So, uh, you know, I would have stayed. I'm a Jersey girl through and through. Yeah. Uh, but the University of Rhode Island was delightful. It's a beautiful state. Um, it's I found it's like the kind of state that like no one really thinks about going to. It's like a state that a lot of people go through to get to Boston or Massachusetts. And yeah. it's so delightful. It's really such a tiny, nice little state. You go to the beach and there's no one there. It's it's very unlike New Jersey in a lot of ways. <laughs> so, yeah. um, just delightful. But happy to be here tonight uh, to talk about offshore winds really, you know, some of the opportunities and challenges of our nation's true next big thing. Uh, it's, it's really exciting for me, as Doug mentioned, to be working over two decades in a sector from its inception here in the United States to coming, you know, bringing now to fruition the development and construction of offshore wind farms across the country. So we'll talk a little bit about the status of those and, uh, you know, hope you find this interesting. You submit some questions and even if you're just here to avoid watching the Mets game, I uh, I feel you. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is going to end at 730 and I might not turn it on. I say that, but I'm going to because I'm a glutton for punishment. But anyhow, to you Mets fans out there, my heart's with you. So let me just tell you a little bit about the special initiative on offshore wind. Uh, we're really unique in the offshore wind space in that, you know, we're not a trade organization we are uh, not an advocacy organization. We really rely on fact-based research and multi-sectoral collaboration to provide expertise, analysis, information sharing, and strategic solutions to advance the responsible and sustainable development of U.S. offshore wind. We are primarily working at the behest of federal and state policymakers and helping them kind of like understand where, you know, I would say kind of the truth lies between the advocacy world and the opponent world and where we can really bring science to bear on what the facts are. And I think one thing we need to clearly understand about offshore wind is that like anything, any energy source or anything we do in the world, it certainly is not without impact. We need to talk about those impacts plainly and honestly, and I think value them and weigh them against the potential benefits and the needs that we have as a society. As we see electrification continuing, whether that's in our vehicle sector, you know, so transportation in our building sector being electrified completely. And we also see at the same time, some of the fossil fuel generated power plants coming offline. So we have this really challenging curve of the actual, uh, de the, the demand for electricity increasing every day while the supply is going down. And so while I like to think about offshore wind as a really great solution um, in a variety of ways, really just for reliability, uh, I, I always ask folks, if not offshore wind, then what? What are we building for New Jersey to actually put electrons on the grid? So while it does provide a lot of really great benefits for the environment and energy uh, and our economy, how do we uh, actually just get electrons into the system so that we can continue to electrify? Very challenging to build nuclear power and the timeline is maybe over a decade at this point. Um, do not see any new fossil fuel generated power plants happening in New Jersey, probably ever. So what are, you know, what are our alternatives? Um, and uh, that's something I just like to kind of plant the seed in the beginning. Uh, we are, uh, we do have a steering committee that is comprised of a, a variety of interests that includes NGOs, offshore wind developers, state policymakers, federal policymakers, coalition groups. So, you know, we have a, like a, a broad approach and, and thought about uh, the way offshore wind moves. We are not a trade organization. We are funded by private foundations, which really to help support some of our objectivity and the unique approach to our work. One project that I would like to highlight before we dive into offshore wind specifically 
is a recent website that we released called offshorewindfacts.org. This features science and data about offshore wind. It does not make any statements about, you know, you know, the accolades of offshore wind. It just lays out in with including all the relevant scientific citations what the potential impacts of offshore wind are on a variety of different impact factors and allows you to make your determination on what you think is reasonable in the marine environment and the onshore environment to bring uh, energy to bear for our nation. It compiles the most current and relevant scientific information about these issues, including marine species, habitats, coastal areas, and local economies. It's a research to help dispel dis and misinformation, which academic and policy organizations has warned that not only with respect to offshore wind and not only in the US, but is on the rise globally. And this is a real, you know, it's a real challenge and a threat to how we're going to really, I think, you know, move move our economies forward and move our nations forward, especially as we continue to combat climate change. The content of the site has been reviewed and vetted by over a dozen different subject matter experts from various academic institutions and environmental nonprofits, including the National Wildlife Federation, the National Audubon Society, Duke University, and others. Please visit offshorewindfacts.org and click on About Us to learn the full process that we went through to post our different 10 re reports. Those will all be continuously updated every quarter so that we're staying fresh, we're staying relevant. There is a feedback button on the website and we would love to hear from you. So please send us uh, you know, what you've learned about offshore wind so we can consider it for inclusion on the site. I think Doug summed it up very well in the beginning of the talk when he said, uh, I, maybe he saw my slides. I don't know how he knew I was going to lead with this, but you know, I call it the triple E where, you know, offshore wind really has some uh, significant solutions to offer around environmental, economic, and energy system benefits. Um, and we're going to talk tonight about, you know, how those kind of get applied and how they work. But in that frame is, uh, you know, kind of what you'll be hearing about tonight. The global perspective of offshore wind is that there's a lot of it out there. Over 10,000 turbines are spinning offshore in our oceans around the, around the world. Half of that is in China, 50% of that is in China. And then you can see the breakdown on the slide here, total installations offshore. The UK has the second most with 20% of the uh, global installations of offshore wind, 11% in Germany, 6% in the Netherlands, 4% in Denmark, and the US is lumped in with rest of world um, <laughs> at 9%. So we'll talk a little bit about where we are in the US and then specifically in New Jersey, since you know I know many of us are a Jersey kind of based crowd. So we're gonna, we're gonna uh, take a closer look at some of that. The first offshore wind farm was uh, installed and operated out of Denmark starting in 1991. Um, and, uh, you know, so we're looking at, you know, 35 years, essentially, or so that offshore wind has been operating in Europe since that first project in Denmark. China has become a later player to the game. It's really only been in the past five years or so that they've gotten into it. And, you know, they've really kind of uh, gone very aggressively into offshore wind with 50 percent of uh, uh, the offshore wind installed in the world in waters off the off the coast of China interesting because i have read and you know i haven't seen updated statistics but i know previously china was developing and and uh and and, and building up to a one coal power plant a month previously and uh what i what i don't know and i'd be curious to learn about and if anyone out there knows um i, I will be uh doing some some looking into this later but you know how offshore wind has helped offset the need to continue to build those fossil fuel type power plants the same essentially thing we're striving for here in the US. The national perspective here in the US, um, we have on the, uh, the, the, the pictorial part of the slide, uh, some numbers from the federal regulator called the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management or BOEM. They are the federal regulator inside the Department of Interior who are regulating uh, clean energy assets off the coast in what's known as the outer continental shelf. Anything essentially in most states, three miles or more off the coast. Operating uh, so far, 
these offshore wind farms, you'll see 174 megawatts. That is not a lot of offshore wind. That is uh, nearly a demonstration scale size project. It's comprised in three projects, the Block Island Wind Farm off the coast of Rhode Island, the Coastal Virginia Project, and the South Fork Wind Project. That's, that's off the coastal Virginia is off the coast of Virginia, obviously South Fork off the coast of Montauk. Um, kind of the, you know, the South Fork of Long Island, hence the name. So that's 174 megawatts, 12, 13, 14, I'm counting 19 turbines, I believe, or 20, I'm not great at math, but uh, about 20 turbines operating for those 174 megawatts versus the 10,000 around the world. So the U.S. is certainly, I would say, on the lower scale of installing offshore wind over this past few decades. But as you can see from some of the numbers in terms of what's under construction, we have three full utility scale projects under construction this year, Vineyard Wind, 800 megawatts, Coastal Virginia Project, 2,600 megawatts, and Revolution Wind, 704 megawatts. Um, and so all those projects are in construction off the coast of the, the east coast of the United States. On the pictorial part of the slide, you can see what BOEM has broken down in terms of what they've been doing statistically up to date uh, as of, I think, today. Um, but the numbers are changing quickly because there's a lot, of, a lot of activity going on at the federal level. But you can see here on the slide that they have competitively leased 12 offshore areas, including ones off the coast of New Jersey. Um, they have issued 35 leases, so they've completed the, the lease sales. But then in terms of the, it, the specific lease areas, they've issued 35 two research leases, site assessment plans are when offshore wind developers are applying to the federal government to do their site assessment work and understand what's potentially offshore. So we issued 17 of those, one general activities plan, which is kind of like an outlier there. And then the real meat of it is in the construction and operation plans, uh, the COPs or COPs as they're known. Essentially an offshore wind developer will write a construction and operation plan typically which are many thousands of pages with many chapters each one outlining the potential impacts of their offshore wind farms to different resource areas and that is both environmental and socioeconomic the developer uh, submits that cop or construction operation plan to boehm you can see 19 have been submitted boehm will then use that document to initiate their environmental review they will uh, develop what's called an environmental impact statement or an EIS under the National Environmental Policy Act using the information in that COP. Um, and then they will review it and then potentially issue what is called a record of decision. That record of decision, once you know they go through all their analysis, will approve the project, disapprove the project, or approve the project with conditions. And... Um, you can see that there are still a few under review and some cops submitted where the uh, EIS process has not started. So that's kind of renewable energy program from BOEM by the numbers. As you can see, there's a lot of activity going on in the offshore space, and there's a lot of interesting ways to be involved and engaged, and we're going to talk about that a little later in the presentation. I do want to make sure that we're level set here and uh, that folks understand the basics on how offshore wind works. If you're if you're new to the conversation, I think it's really important just to kind of, uh, you know, have the basic understanding of the infrastructure. Now, on the left hand of the slide, you'll see a schematic of an offshore wind turbine. And that is like, you know, the star player of the offshore wind farm, if you will, the lead singer. That's the Mick Jagger, right? Wind turbines. That's the part that everyone knows and focuses on. And there are so many more very critical components to offshore wind farms. So let's say the wind farm has 100 turbines in it. You would need to connect those turbines together with what are known as array cables. So wind farm array is the all the turbines together, and they're combined with the array cables, which are strung from turbine to turbine, and they're buried underneath the seabed. Typically, they're buried four to six feet or two to three meters underneath the seafloor. And this helps prevent any damage from any type of external aggression, like an anchor or a clam dredge or you know other types of uh, external activities. So the developer has all the interests in mind to try to really protect these valuable resources that they've installed, so they bury them. All those cables come together in an offshore substation. 
Now, depending on how many turbines are in this wind farm, multiple substations may be needed. And as I mentioned in my bio up front, I'm a policy person, I'm a communications person, I'm a writer, I am not a scientist, I am not an electrician. So if I can't answer questions about the magic that happens in an offshore substation, I apologize, but I do know it's very important that they are there, they are consolidating the power, they are converting the power so that when it's transmitted to land, it is most efficient, it has the least amount of line losses, right? Because some of these wind farms are, you know, dozens of miles offshore. So that's very important. Then once all the cables are connected together in the offshore substation, the single export or sometimes several export cable, but you know, maybe two to three, depending on again on the size of the wind farm, will deliver the power to shore. Again, that that uh high voltage cable will be buried under the seafloor. And uh, a process that's typically known as horizontal directional drilling will then take the cable underneath the beach when it meets land to uh, an onshore substation. And so, um, you know, the project that was furthest along in New Jersey, that was the Ocean Wind One project that was fully permitted and procured. That project has since been canceled. But that project, for example, one of the landfall locations was at Island Beach State Park. So if you go to Island Beach State Park and drive all the way down to the farthest parking lot south, you would find uh, last year construction equipment. And what they were doing was laying um, duct banks or big uh, you know, um, conduits so that cable could be pulled through there. This way, you're pulling this under the beach. You're not disturbing any of the sensitive coastal habitat. And essentially, you're never seeing anything but one of those utility holes that's in the parking lot. They do all that construction off season, so it's not disruptive, which is great. And no one ever sees the cables. They run underground until that next onshore substation. Then the cables will come uh, above land into those transmission towers that we all know and see around the state and deliver the electricity to homes and businesses throughout the region. So that's like the basics on you know how offshore wind gets to us and, and how it works. There are th and there are th really three primary reasons why New Jersey and the region on the East Coast is really considered Mecca for offshore wind and why we've seen so much interest and activity around developing offshore wind power. As you can see on the slide in front of you from our friends at the National Renewable Energy Lab, um, we really have really wonderful wind speeds off the coast of New Jersey and kind of increasing as you go further north. Consistent wind speeds of at least eight meters per second will make offshore wind very economical. So um, you'll see that off the coast of New Jersey, based on the colored grid here, uh, we certainly have very robust wind speeds. Now you say, oh, but look, it looks like Northern California has, you know, great wind speeds. You know, what's going on? What's going on on the West Coast? We're going to talk a little bit about that now. Second map I want to show you before we go into that is a map of a, the electricity use and the lights from of the United States from space. This is provided by NASA. It's a very cool image. And you can see the incredible amount of electricity demand that we have essentially on the Route 95 corridor between Massachusetts and DC. That is one of the most intensively used electricity um, in, in, the, in the country is right there in that corridor. So now we have another check mark for why New Jersey and this region is so valuable in terms of offshore wind development. And then the final thing that I wanted to share is really concerning the depth of the offshore environment and how challenging it can be once waters get deeper to install offshore wind. So you can see in the light color blue that off the coast of New Jersey and really most of the Atlantic, and as you know, there's a very gently sloping shelf. So there's a big opportunity to be able to fix these turbines to the seafloor as they are typically with a monopile foundation uh, because of the shallow water depths. So this is the uh, Atlantic seaboard, why it has been a focus, right? So we have the combination of high wind speeds, very strong demand for electricity and a beautifully buildable environment. So that has been why the focus has been here. However, 
the next frontier for offshore wind are is you know they say the future is floating and that is true for offshore wind you can see the different foundation types um on the screen in front of you on the far left i mean 90 plus the far amount far the far most amount of mono of offshore wind farms that have been installed are on monopile foundations that's what's typically proposed off the coast of new jersey um, to the right of it, the jacket tripod is also another fixed bottom technology that's used. It actually was used for the Block Island wind farm, and that's more of a supply chain issue than a technical need. But uh, those are the two foundations with monopile being the most used. Right now, uh, there's advanced research and development happening on floating structures. There are some uh, there are some demo projects that have been launched in Europe. Um, there's a, uh, a subscale, like a, you know, I, I think a one third scale model that's been, uh, launched in Maine. And so when you hit those deeper waters, because it's too deep to install a monopile, anything you'll see uh, over 50 meters or so will need to be on a floating foundation. As the folks at the federal regulars like, uh, regulators like to remind us, floating foundations are not new. Uh, they are newer to offshore wind, but they have been used in the oil and gas environment in the Gulf of Mexico for decades. And so it's really, you know, repurposing the principles, the engineering principles of floating offshore, of floating oil and gas and bringing that to the offshore wind sector. And in fact, we do find a lot of corollaries. And as, you know, more companies are converting their oil and gas profiles to other types of energy, they're using their experience in the marine environment to apply that to offshore wind energy. So we're very fortunate that way to have that really robust knowledge and history in the Gulf of Mexico and the United States to be able to work towards offshore wind and continue to create that level of energy independence for our nation. In terms of what's going on in New Jersey, I'd like to give you an update. Uh, back in 2022, Governor Murphy signed Executive Order 307, which set a state offshore wind generation goal of 1100 megawatts or 11 gigawatts, if you want to just move the decimal place over a few, 11 gigawatts of offshore wind by the year 2040. And so there have been, and, and just to, I guess, take a step back, I, I apologize, I jump ahead too quickly sometimes, but essentially the way it works is that the federal agencies, the, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is the one that's going to lease the offshore area and then it is the states typically who actually do the procurement. And so there are kind of two work streams that are happening in parallel. I like to think of it like first you buy the property to build a house and then you get the mortgage. Not exactly, but kind of like that. In my mind, that's how it works. So we have the federal leasing happening and then the state setting goals. And these are really driven by the state's need for electrification, right, for clean energy targets. Um, and for environmental targets like cleaning our air and other resources in the state. There have been three award around rounds so far. The first round was Ocean Wind 1, which that project has now been canceled because a developer no longer has decided to develop that project. The second round was the Atlantic Shores and Ocean Wind 2. So Atlantic Shores is still developing that round, but Ocean Wind 2 is also now out of the picture. And we have in the third round, which just was announced in February of this year, Leading Light and Attentive Energy 2. And these numbers, sometimes people are like, what are these numbers? Well, you know, essentially, because lease areas tend to be quite large off the coast, uh, maybe a developer only wants to try to procure and develop half of the lease area in one bidding round to the state. So they'll say, yes, we'll take half of our lease area you know, a thousand megawatts or so and put it into this procurement. And then in another state, maybe they're bidding in another, you know, into another procurement. I think my next slide actually goes into that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, what does it even mean to be in New Jersey with offshore wind, right? Because as we know, wind is a regional resource, the oceans are a regional resource. And so to be in a state is kind of a misnomer, right? Because you know, you'll see uh, on the slide the three three nautical mile boundary, and that's really where state waters have jurisdiction. Once you get beyond that, that's you know the federal you know federal jurisdiction, and um, that's where all these lease areas are. So you can see on the slide here um, in the bottom left hand corner, like nominally off the coast of Atlantic City, 
that there are four what are called OCS blocks. Um, and the OCS stands for Outer Continental Shelf. So those four OCS blocks are shown. The top two belong to Atlantic Shores and the bottom two belong to Orsted. And then you'll see uh, the colored, in, in, in the colored polygons, those are part of what's known as the New York Bite. And a B-I-G-H-T Bite is uh, an oceanographic term that really, that defines uh, an ocean area by a variety of different factors. And so um, we know this area, the New York Bight, as stretching from Cape May in New Jersey all the way out to the east end of Long Island and Montauk and drawing a big, I'm sorry, I don't have a slide for it, but it's a big rectangle that extends east off the coast of New Jersey. And so the projects that are here really have the potential to deliver into New Jersey or New York. And we work very closely, I mean, Delaware for that matter, right? We, we uh, work really closely, the states work really closely together to kind of coordinate on those things. But it really is a question of transmission. You know, how, how long do the developers want to stretch a power cable to connect the offshore wind farm to a state to deliver the power there? And there's a lot of flexibility for developers in that, except, you know, they're just figuring out the cost equation on those things. So interesting slide. I love maps. I hope this is helpful. I want to talk a little bit more about this leasing process that we've been talking about. We talked about the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM, as they're known, who are the lead federal agency in the permitting of offshore wind. But it really starts quite early. Uh, you know, when you see, you know, development of an offshore wind farm and it's being constructed, there have been many years of planning and public input once we get to that stage. So, um, you know, the we call this the infamous Boehm rainbow slide, which is approximately seven to nine years of time um, from when Boehm orig an, initiates their leasing process. They go through an extensive area identification process. They recently completed this in the central Atlantic area off the coast of Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware. So they start this planning and analysis process. Stakeholder input is considered and then they'll publish a leasing notice after they've gone through this year or so of the first area identification. You'll then get to the light blue, which says leasing, where there is a lease auction and leases are granted for developers to start uh, to start doing their offshore wind site investigations work. The leases, uh, the auctions are, it's a highest bidder style auction. Um, they are done online and it's kind of fascinating to go behind the scenes. Uh, it's open to the public. Every 30 minutes, another developer takes a bid and you can click refresh and see, you know, how the leasing is going. It's pretty exciting. I don't know if it's exactly the same in oil and gas, but it's a similar type of process where those rights are then, uh, you know, given to a developer to start their work in the offshore space in their lease area. Uh, the next thing to do is to work on some site assessment, understanding what the, uh, you know, what the wind speeds are, what the geophysical conditions are, the geotechnical condi uh, conditions, environmental conditions, doing surveys to understand what fish are in the area, marine mammals, building off desktop, existing data sets, adding data uh, to that. You know, one thing that um, is really kind of exciting, I, I like to think about, and Doug and I are actually working on a, on a project together uh, in this realm, but, you know, the, the, the developers, when they bid on a lease area, are also required for every megawatt that they bid to, to give the state of New Jersey, and also this is a similar requirement in the state of New York, $10,000 per megawatt. And so literally the states in the region have you know now uh, been awarded tens of millions of dollars in marine research, marine research, and I mean those kind of dollars in you know research, especially for the oceans, are really unheard of. So this opportunity that we're seeing from these research dollars being poured into the uh, ocean environment are really fortuitous. In addition to that, we will have these offshore structures where we can study a space uh, that is you know, less well studied than the surface of the moon. We all know that, uh, that old expression. So, you know, taking, you know, using offshore wind structures as potential platforms for research. 
So they finish the developers finish their site assessment phase. They submit that construction and operation plan, that COP that we talked about, right? That COP, which kind of brings together all the desktop and offshore information they've collected. They submit that construction operation plan to BOEM. Meanwhile, they're doing a bunch of state permitting. We're going to talk about that too. And BOEM has the opportunity to approve their construction and operation plan, issue a record of decision, and then the developers can get to work. So that's a seven to nine year lead time on these projects. So not only is there a very rigorous review under the National Environmental Policy Act, but it, uh, you know, there's really, um, really robust opportunities for public engagement. Don't try to read this slide. I just one day thought I would try to collect all the different statutes and regulations and laws that cover an offshore wind. And I know there's a lot of words here, but you can see here, uh, you know, besides National Environmental Policy Act, we have Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries, Sanctuaries Act, Clean Air Act, the Jones Act, Energy Policy Act, very many reviews and uh, regulations in the offshore space. And though BOEM is the lead agency who is reviewing the project, they are working with other what are known as consulting agencies, and that includes the National Marine Fisheries Service, the EPA, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and very, who, you know, the folks who have essentially the jurisdiction over these acts, depending on the species in question or the topic in question. So there's a lot of reviews going on for sure. Um, importantly, just, you know, kind of getting a little closer to a home here on New Jersey, uh, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection has the authority for state permitting including regulatory oversight of offshore wind energy transmission cables that are coming to shore as we talked about and the infrastructure built in state waters, as well as those onshore activities. So the onshore substation, transmission towers, upgrades, digging cables, you know, laying them in the road, whatever that might be. New Jersey DEP has authority, full permitting needs to happen. Some of those permits required are listed here. This is a subset of them. And then of course, so important, the federal consistency review, um, which, uh, you know, the the state will review the projects to ensure that they are consistent with the uh, the Coastal Zone Management Acts in the, here in the state of New Jersey. Uh, I think this is my last slide and we're going to turn over to questions, but, you know, just to kind of like sum up some of the issues, I think, and, you know, I mean, it, it's a great, it's a challenge and an opportunity for me uh, to have to cover offshore wind in 40 minutes, um, but uh, it's fun. And I just wanted to be able to summarize some of the, some of the issues here. The opportunities really are, you know, around the economic development. We have, I actually have a couple, I remember now I have a couple of slides, pictures to show you of some really exciting physical projects that are happening in the state that are generating jobs now and helping to um, really helping to transform coastal and marine port communities that have been, you know, in need of jobs and economic development for decades. The environmental benefits, you know, of bringing off, bringing fossil fuel generation offline, uh, being able to help clean our air, deliver, deliver to environmental justice communities who have been, you know, suffering for decades under fossil fuel generated power plants in their communities, certainly climate change mitigation. We are suffering here in New Jersey. Uh, I was just mentioning to folks before we started the webinar that I've been house shopping in Monmouth County and, you know, looking at floodplain maps and, you know, <laughs> thinking twice about where I'm going to buy a home based on sea level rise and what the predictions are. Actually, now it's required in all of the mortgage contracts or whatever they call those documents that, um, you know, there's disclosures about sea level rise in the state of New Jersey so that folks are aware because, you know, we, we, we know it's coming and how can we figure out ways to mitigate against that? And certainly electricity generation is a large contributor to greenhouse gases. And then overall, as we talked about, the reliable energy supply, that supply that will bring electrons to the grid and, you know, something that, you know, we need in the state of New Jersey and, you know, we don't see a lot of other types of generation opportunities here in New Jersey. Folks ask me, why not solar? You know, solar is really challenging at scale in New Jersey. One, we don't have a great solar resource. I mean, it's been nice and sunny the past few days, but, you know, we're not really known like the southern states to have that really high capacity factor for solar. 
So that's not great for us. And we just don't have the open spaces that you would need many, many open, open acres to locate solar folder farms. We don't have space for onshore wind farms, nor do we have the right resource onshore. So, you know, getting that re reliable energy supply to the state of New Jersey really depends on offshore wind energy. Some of the biggest challenges we have in offshore wind, um, and we could talk all night about those too, but some of the things that keep me up at night are the challenges around interconnecting wind farms. Um, if you think about the way that our electricity system was designed specifically here in New Jersey and on the East Coast, if you, the analogy I like to use is thinking about a power plant like a heartbeat. And that power plant, let's say it's located in Pennsylvania, and you know, it's a natural gas fired power plant and it's pumping out the electricity with each heartbeat and it's sending out electricity over the wires. Well, by the time it gets to the furthest Eastern parts of the quote unquote body in this case, you're really down to the tiniest capillaries. Once you get to the you know coastal counties of New Jersey, you're really at the capillaries. And so now we're thinking about completely transforming the way we're delivering energy to New Jersey. And instead of going west to east, we're gonna be going east to west. Megawatts and gigawatts of offshore wind developed off the coast and then being pumped in the opposite direction. And they're meeting these tiny capillaries that can't accept that huge amount of power. So we're rethinking about how we're strengthening the grid, which is a great thing for New Jersey coastal communities, how we're using shared transmission to help bring these projects online at scale and a variety of different interconnection opportunities. New Jersey is a leader in this, in fact, working with the national, uh, the, sorry, the regional grid operator called PJM on it's kind of a policy wonk thing. We can definitely talk about it later. It's called the state agreement approach which no other state is using to help us figure out how we can collect transmission separate from the offshore wind farms and then kind of join the projects. It's kind of a long story. Uh, stakeholder concerns. We see a lot of stakeholder concerns out there. Developers are working very robustly out in the environment. We see federal regulators. We see the state regulators. In fact, just next week, uh, love to call your attention to a set of hearings that New Jersey DEP is hosting. I personally will be attending uh, the Atlantic Shores hearing hosted by DEP on Tuesday, May 28th at five o'clock <clears throat> in Bayville. So maybe I'll see you there, but the DEP will be providing a lot of great information on the Atlantic Shores project and taking your feedback as stakeholders, as we all are here in the state of New Jersey on these projects. The most robust concerns we typically hear are from the fishing community, uh, the, whether it's commercial recreational fishermen and concerns about access to where they have historically fished and that potential displacement um, whereby they would not be able to catch fish uh, because they're worried about access to that area. Right now, wind farms are sited about one nautical mile, one nautical mile in the row and column, which was designed to allow for fishing to happen within those areas. And since we don't have any large scale offshore wind farms yet, we'll see the appetite of fishermen to fish in those areas. Um, so that is, you know, a stakeholder concern we could talk about for a long time. Um, but certainly, and then, you know, finally, I'll just mention some supply chain constraints and costs. Uh, right now, because it's a nascent industry here in the US, we don't have a fully developed supply chain. And that can be challenging, whether it's vessels and ports, or the turbines themselves, which are currently still being imported from Europe because we don't really have enough to have the manufacturers coming here to the US. So the supply chain, uh, you know, is certainly also a big issue and that it also involves the port areas. I'm just gonna skip through these couple because I just wanna show a couple slides, Doug, because I like to show the photos and then we'll, because I know it's already 715. Um, I wanna show some cool port photos. I've had the opportunity to, you know, my. One thing that's great about being an offshore wind for over 20 years is that I'm always at the beach. I'm always at the coast for my job. And that's like amazing. I'm sure, Doug, that's why you like being a marine extension agent as well. Um, but uh, really, it's a public and private sector partnership between the state of New Jersey and the offshore wind developers that are bringing forth the ports here uh, in New Jersey. Two I really want to highlight are the one at the port of Paulsboro and then in lower Alouise, Alouise Creek. 
Both of these are on the Delaware River on their way up to Philadelphia. And what's really important to note about offshore wind is that the structures and the vessels are really tall. And so they need to have proper clearance to be able to head out to the open ocean. The Port of Paulsboro is essentially as, as far north as you can get on the Delaware River before you start encountering whether it's a bridge or transmission lines crossing um, from you know Delaware to Pennsylvania. I'm sorry, from New Jersey to Pennsylvania. And so it's a real challenge to make sure, you know, that whatever port you're considering has open access to the ocean. So that's one thing to really consider. We see developers developing ports in concert with the states. This is a conceptual drawing of what is happening in Paulsboro, which is essentially nearly complete at this point. In the port of Paulsboro, the company called EEW, who are a German manufacturer who have now create an entire manufacturing facility at the Port of Paulsboro to roll these big steel tubes called monopiles. These monopiles are what the turbine will rest on once they're installed in the ocean. So that's a monopile. Um, this picture is really cool for scale. This is one of the first monopiles that was uh, constructed right here in New Jersey at the Port of Paulsboro. And you can see how tiny those little people look uh, based on the size. And I won't try to tell you what the diameter is because I'm terrible with numbers, but uh, by scale, you understand that these are very large structures and they're being manufactured right here in New Jersey with uh, also with our labor unions, which is great. In New Jersey, we will also have the nation's first purpose-built offshore wind marshalling port, furthering New Jersey's position as a hub for the U.S. offshore wind industry. So really, this, this is the Lower Alloways Creek um, and it is co-located co with the PSENG nuclear facility. If you're familiar with that, uh, that power plant in Salem, that power plant had area that was available on the river and was, had already gone through some pre-permitting. So New Jersey Economic Development Authority, EDA, took over that area and is now essentially complete. Um, pretty, I mean, I saw the site a couple months ago and it's essentially ready to do what's called offshore wind marshalling. And the goal of marshalling with offshore wind is to do all of the kind of pre-construction you can do on land because it's expensive, it's you know time consuming, and it's less safe to do those type of that type of construction offshore. So really the goal is to do all the marshalling possible um, here uh, at the port of the New Jersey wind port, which will be available not only for New Jersey projects, but Delaware, Maryland, New York, whoever wants to use this port is available to lease the area and uh, really be a great sense of uh, source of pride for New Jersey's offshore wind portfolio. On the screen now is my reminder of my name, my email address, chris at offshorewindpower.org and my cell phone number. Nothing makes me happier than an offshore wind text question. That's my favorite. So please do take, that is my personal line, always available on it, 201-850-3690. I'm a Northern New Jersey girl currently and uh, happy to transition over to questions and answers, Doug. Awesome, thank you very much, Chris. You did a fantastic job of uh, keeping that tough task of about 40 minutes of uh, a crash course and overview of offshore wind globally, but also here in New Jersey. A lot of the descriptions too and the analogies of the heartbeat, uh, very good job of delivering the message. Uh, we have uh, a healthy number of Q, uh, questions in the chat that I think are going to help us learn even more as we extract more knowledge from your from your brain there on offshore wind. So I try to organize them in a, in a sensible fashion, a little bit more starting with uh, some of the parameters of the different projects and then biological. Uh, and Steve just cast a poll in the chat. So while people listen to the Q&A, if you can provide feedback in the evaluation poll, that'd be much appreciated. Uh, but Chris, Kathleen had a few questions. Uh, uh, first one was, how many wind turbines are proposed per project? Say the Seaval project off Virginia or Atlantic Shores. Uh, I'm not sure. You might have mentioned that, but can you reiterate if you didn't? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, numbers are not my strong suit. So, you know, I apologize, but I'm, I'll do my best to answer these. The Atlantic Shores project, I believe, is 147 turbines. And the best way to, I'm going to get down my calculator. So the best way to do this is you take the size of the project and CVAO is 2,600 megawatts. You divide it by the size of the turbine. I think CVAO is 15 megawatts. And that is about 174 turbines. 
So that is a, that's a good way to figure out the exact number um, mm -hmm. to meet New Jersey's clean energy goals. We'll need, uh, you know, I mean, what's the challenging thing is like, you don't know the size of the turbine is going to influence how many turbines make up that total number. So if you have a thousand turbines, I'm sorry, a thousand megawatts and each, uh, you know, turbine is 15 megawatts. So we'll do that like that example. So you can like definitely do this math anytime. 1000 mm -hmm. divided by 15 is 66. So, you know, the, the, the wind farms are dozens up to hundreds of wind uh, of turbines per wind farm. Great. And as the technology advances, the turbines typically get larger and able to harness more power, right? Exactly. So right now, a 15 to 18 megawatt turbine is industry standard. We're going to see if and how they continue to grow. There's a certain tension there in terms of, you know, every time there's a significant modification to the turbine, that flows down the supply chain. And it's really challenging to keep up, right? Because now ports need to get bigger. Shipping lanes need to get bigger, you know, manufacturing sites need to get bigger. And what we're hearing is that we're maxing out in a lot of these areas. So there will be a point where it needs to be capped so that, uh, you know, we can just continue to build the projects in the current portfolio. Thanks, Chris. Earlier on, you showed the map, too, of uh, where these projects are occurring, including off New Jersey, uh, as we focused in there. An anonymous attendee is wondering why is offshore wind not being moved further off the New Jersey coast? Uh, it's planned to be closer to shore off New Jersey than anywhere else. It's actually both. Um, and I don't know if it would help if I flip back to that slide, Doug. Please would do so. Yeah. We, just so, you yeah. know, I can just show folks it's, you know, pictures worth a thousand words. Right. Um, so it's actually both things in New Jersey. This is these are the lease areas that we can see off the coast. So uh, these closer in were the original uh, wind farm areas, the lease areas that are, you know, kind of you can see where it says Tom's River and it's south down to Cape May County. These, um, you know, were the earliest sited wind farms and they have been in process and development, as we mentioned, for about a decade now. These additional lease areas that are further offshore were recently sited. There is a gap in between them because there is a major shipping port, as most folks know, out of port of Newark and Elizabeth. And so, uh, you know, the area in between cannot be used for offshore wind. Um, but we do have kind of like the western ones and then the eastern ones here in the ocean. Great. Thanks, Chris. I, I was looking at the questions, but I, I caught you mentioning that the major shipping lanes in and out of New York Harbor. But also there's the tug and tow. Did you mention the tug and tow is also obviously, you know, not, uh, a major shipping lane about five to eight miles off the beach too. So exactly, uh, and a lot of reasons where, you know, the turbines can't be any closer to shore. Um, and part of that is, you know, as you mentioned, Doug, the, the tug and tow traffic, but also because of migratory corridors for birds. Um, National Audubon recognizes climate change as the biggest threat to avian and bat species in the world and are strong, they say, they're fierce proponents of offshore wind. They do have one condition, though, that offshore wind farms on the East Coast be sited at least eight miles from shore, because if they're any closer, then they are within that migratory corridor. And so these lease areas uh, that are shaded in gray were sited in conjunction with consultation with National Audubon Society and other stakeholders to avoid those impacts. Awesome, you predicted a, a question. Uh, Jody had that exact question. Uh, so Jody, there there you go, uh, it came up naturally in conversation. Uh, I don't know if it's the same or not, but uh, anonymous attendee had, it was related, so I assume it's the same person, but a follow-up that was actually pitched more towards me uh, with regards to the spacing from shore is Rutgers inputting into BOEM on the environmental impacts of the New Jersey offshore wind plans at nine miles offshore or, and yes, whether it be the lease sites that are closer to shore or further offshore, uh, we have a high degree of uh, activity at Rutgers. I put in the chat, we have the Rutgers Offshore Wind Energy Collaborative. It's quite unique for Rutgers. We obviously have five campuses, New Brunswick, Piscataway, but also Newark and Camden. Our Offshore Wind Collaborative is bringing across faculty, researchers and students from all nine or uh, seven of those campuses to collaborate on research and education, outreach, workforce development related to offshore wind. Uh, and we sometimes make 
comment, different groups into public comment periods from scientific perspectives on certain issues, but we're very active in research to address the needs of this developing industry on a whole suite of biological, physical, technical, policy-based, uh, even psychological and, and sociology research related to renewable energy and, and offshore wind. Uh, so if you take a look at the Rutgers Offshore Wind Collaborative webpage, you'll learn uh, more about some Rutgers, some of Rutgers' many activities in this space. Uh, Kathleen asked also something that you hear about that we get asked every time we do a program on offshore wind and is in the press quite a bit, Chris. Uh, what happens to the wind turbines after they go past their life? Uh, are any of the parts recyclable in the USA? Yes, over 90% of the wind turbine is recyclable. The actual, we didn't get to talk about the economics of offshore wind and that's such a hot topic. So I'm sorry that we didn't get to get there. And that's a great one if anyone wants to follow up with me. But um, one of the reasons that offshore wind had such big cost escalation challenges over the past few years is because the bulk of the turbine is made of steel and then there's some other copper components and things. And the even though inflation rates were eight to 10%, the in the rate of the cost of steel and copper increased by over a hundred percent, and so that was really challenging because it's the major component of offshore wind. And as we know, those type of heavy metals are easily recyclable. So over you know a large the, the 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 bulk of the turbine is recyclable. The one big project that is being worked on globally by really some very interesting you know edu uh, academic and research partners. Um, across the continents is how to recycle the blades. The blades are made of a special composite material and that type of composite material are not yet recyclable. Fortunately, we have 25 to 30 years, which is the lifespan of the turbine to ensure that by the time we need to retire these wind farms, we have a responsible way to do that. Um, I just read a great study, Doug, um, out of some researchers in Australia who uh, quantified for onshore wind that by year two, because of the benefits they're providing to the environment, um, the wind farms are uh, their carbon net zero. And so that's a really great finding. And I asked the researchers when they were going to be working on offshore wind farms, because they're slightly different, but have a lot of the same components. Um, but really, we're seeing a high degree that are recyclable. And then certainly, of course, during the life of the project, they're delivering clean energy as well. That's cool to know. Yeah. And uh... We don't often think about that with our other uses, like of our cars and recycling. So hopefully that innovation is already existing or uh, percolates a lot of our other uh, uses of uh, metals and et, et, et cetera. I've also saw not only recycling, but reusing them for playgrounds to guardrails yes. and highways and everything. So yeah. I would like one in my backyard, a little, little backyard art. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting. And my car is about to turn 290,000 miles. So in my opinion, it's just, it's a Honda, you know, they go forever. It's just like, use it as long as you can, right? And then, uh, and then certainly uh, we'll do the most recycling as possible. Uh, Lawrence was wondering, isn't there an existing wind farm next to Atlantic City? Uh, and if so, how much is electricity is being produced? Uh, so if you want to add to it, anything more about on land versus, versus offshore capabilities? Yeah, would love to. Um, I love the Atlantic City Wind Farm. Uh, that Atlantic City Wind Farm is built, um, and they do tours, so you should get yourself down there. It's it's quite beautiful. Um, it's co-located with a wastewater treatment facility there in Atlantic City, so I highly recommend going on a cool, breezy day and not a hot, stagnant day. Let me just put it that way. Um, but it's called the Jersey Atlantic Wind Farm, and it's comprised of five turbines. The uh, total combined capacity of that wind farm is 7.5 megawatts, and that's enough power for 2,500 homes in the Atlantic City area. The first thing that that wind farm does, though, is it services the wastewater treatment facility, which is a very highly energy intensive use. So uh, they tell me if you go down to the ACUA and do the tour, they say, it's funny, when we were just a wastewater treatment plant, no one wanted to do tours. But now that we have a wind farm, <laughs> so I think it's been, I mean, it's over 10 years now since they built that ACUA um, wind farm down there. And if you go to the Borgata, you can ask for rooms where you can have a wind farm view, which I always do when I go. It's a great project. Yeah. And interestingly, you know, National, uh, sorry, New Jersey Audubon was very skeptical about that project. And they said, you know, this is a migratory flyway. 
five big turbines. We want full access, full study. So they did five or seven years of, you know, uh, you know, uh, they, they searched underneath the turbines for potential bird collisions. New Jersey had allowed a certain number of collisions and it ended up being less than one bird per turbine per year. So far fewer, tur far fewer birds dying than in that faded uh, Borgata uh, parking structure. If anyone's ever been in the, when you walk up and down the stairs, there's always birds dead in there. So, you know, yeah. it's delivering clean energy and it's doing it in a responsible way, I guess. So that's, that's the good story. I've heard it said stray cats are killing more birds. Exactly. Uh, Your cat inside. Uh, two questions related to Ocean Wind. One, if you have any knowledge you're able to say. Uh, Stanislav's wondering, is it true that the Jones Act was the primary reason for uh, that Orsted pulled out of the contract? Uh, and Kathleen's wondering, uh, is anybody else stepping in? Uh, I think Orsted said they're holding on to the lease, or is there any uh, possibilities or updates on, on the Ocean Wind 1 projects? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to share on that. Um, and, you know, while I was at Orsted for several years, uh, you know, before, you know, was, I, I left there about three and a half years ago, so I don't have great insider information, um, but I do know a lot about the sector in general. And I'm impressed by the Jones Act question, because that's someone who knows their, you know, century old maritime law, which is <laughs> near and dear to my heart. Uh, but the Jones Act essentially says that uh, any uh, offshore, any port in the United States um, needs to be serviced by vessels that are U.S. flagged and U.S. staffed. And right now, there are only three vessels in the entire world that can build the size of the offshore wind turbines and farms that we have scoped here in New Jersey. So Orsted did cite when they decided they would no longer be building Ocean Wind 1 that uh, the vessel availability was an issue. Um, and so I'm not sure to what degree you know, that played, you know, in their decisions. I think there were a lot of real challenges going on it, the kind of the macroeconomic level at that time. The challenges the developers saw were that they needed to lock into a certain fixed price for each state. So like, let's say they said five years ago, we're going to build the project for 10 cents a kilowatt hour. But then after, you know, five years pass, COVID happens, inflation, interest rates are skyrocketing. They actually need to then put the, you know, orders in for the contract for the materials and everything is, you know, so expensive. And so that's why we saw like kind of a, a spate of developers pulling out of projects, rebidding those projects into different rounds so that they could adjust the pricing. So um, that's where Orsted, you know, stood with that project. The current status is that, you know, they still own that lease area. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure the exact year, you know, how the years work out, but they're, you know, kind of well within their rights. Um, I would guess that, you know, they would be interested in, uh, you know, selling the selling either the project or the lease area. They, in fact, weren't even the original owners of that lease area. They bought it from a company called Res, R-E-S, Res Americas, um, you know, back, I think, in 2018. So the lease areas can be sold. Um, Boehm does have a process for transferring the lease areas. And sometimes I wish that I bought a lease area instead of buying my house. Because back in the day, you could get a lease area for under half a million dollars. And Doug, we'd be sitting pretty if we bought a lease area. Yeah, the last, the, what was 4.4 billion combined for those six New York Byte leases. Yeah. Uh, one of them went for over a billion dollars, so. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, so um, did I answer all the parts of that question? Yes, you did. It was about the Jones Act and then uh, anything about the, the fate of the, yeah. the lease. And I'd like to meet Kathleen. Kathleen, I hope you took my number down because she has some great questions. She is she is great. And I'm, I'm going through here because <laughs> I think others are probably asking. So uh, a few asked for more information about environmental or biological uh, issues. Uh, you already it came up naturally about birds. Uh, but Kathleen also was asked, interested in somebody else about fish. Um, so some of these areas are prime habitat, essential fish habitat for spawning, migration, juveniles, adults. Uh, what is being done to protect the fish um, from the different components of wind farm construction? 
Yeah, um, that's a that's a great question. There, um, I am also just dropping into the chat again, not being a scientist. If I put in for hosts and panelists, that I can put a link in, Doug, in the or actually to everybody. If you hit the drop down there oh, okay. to everyone, you should, I think you should see everyone. Mm, unfortunately, I just see hosts and panelists, and then all right, send it to me, and I'll send it to everybody. Okay. So this is the offshorewindfacts.org website that I mentioned earlier that we just published. We have an entire um, multi-page peer-reviewed section on fish and fisheries and the mitigation measures that are being used um, for that type of work. This was reviewed by the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance, ROSA, who are based right here in New Jersey and are essentially you know, tasked with how to figure out how to do offshore wind right for fish. Um, so some of the things that are happening are that when there's spe specific essential, essential fish habitat, the turbines are, you know, site you know, micro sited in the wind farm so that they're not directly over essential fish habitat. If there are critically endangered species like the Atlantic sturgeon, for example, those need to be studied and ensured that they're not in the area. Um, there are a variety, you know, of things. And I'm not, you know, I'm not a fisheries biologist, but I'd also be happy to connect Kathleen or others on that. And please review. Uh, I would say that it's just, you know, I think a five or six page study that has all the very current citations about fish and offshore wind. Great job, Chrissy. I'm gonna look at that too. And actually I wear a lot of hats, but one I, one way I would identify is a fisheries biologist. So uh, oh. I think that, that well, thing- Would you like to comment on the question a little bit more? Yeah, I think that was a great response. A pitch towards an, a, a, a vote of confidence towards ROSA and the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance is a great one. They have an advisory committee and a scientific panel that really captures the most active and also science-based minded commercial and recreational fishing stakeholders in the region, as well as the other fisheries biologists uh, who are in, involved with monitoring before, during, and after of these wind farm constructions, myself and colleagues included here at Rutgers University. Uh, and uh, there are guidelines from BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management for monitoring fish before and after wind farm construction. And each of the wind farms is responding to those guidelines in different ways and based upon the fish and fisheries that happen at their respective leases. And that's taken shape from anywhere from three to eight different surveys for up to six or seven years at each wind farm to monitor the fish before and after. Plus, uh, Chris mentioned the RMI, Research and Monitoring Initiative through DEP. There's a lot of fish and fisheries related research being funded through that, as well as birds, marine mammals, sea turtles, uh, just to name a few of the work that's already ongoing to understand the environmental impacts to these resources from wind farm construction. And pitch it back to you, Chris, you're leading the uh, initiative on offshore wind, but no, you're also leading the initiative on fisheries mitigation and compensation. Yes, so, a very good one. Right. So, I mean, to the extent that there are impacts, I mean, I don't know how you know, how familiar folks are. I do know that we I speak to a lot of audiences really around the country and the New Jersey folks, they're on point. They're smart, they're informed. So I love New Jersey and I love you guys for being out there because you ask great questions and you know. So one thing that you may know about is the National Environmental Policy Act. And there's something called the mitigation hierarchy that's enshrined in that law. First requires that uh, uh, impacts be avoided Secondly, they be minimized when they can't be avoided, and then finally mitigated when they cannot be avoided or minimized. And so one thing that SIOW, my organization, is working on is the launch of a regional compensation framework for fishermen if there are, in fact, un unminimizable or unavoidable impacts from offshore wind projects. And so there is a stopgap measure um, because we do want to make sure that you know, some of the, the you know, most historic and, uh, you know, you know, really deep um, uses of the ocean uh, by the fishermen are being respected as, as offshore wind is being developed. And it's a tool really we can get to um, through and, and get to coexistence of these, uh, of these resources offshore. Cool. Thanks, Chris. And I threw that link in the chat from BOEM, at least they're reducing or avoiding impacts to fisheries uh, in there. Uh, also, I, we did a great job. I think we basically got through every question that was that was relevant. Uh, I'll give you the, the opportunity. One more thing. I know that you your group published 
wow, two years ago now, but the public participation guide as well. I threw that in the chat before. So if people want to get involved, they could uh, follow some of the guidance in that uh, resource, I imagine, still relevant. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, so there are like really specific and, and legally required opportunities for public input in that National Environmental Policy Act process. We stay engaged. Um, I really, uh, you know, coming from being an offshore wind developer for a couple decades, we spend a lot of time getting early input from stakeholders because that's when it's kind of most natural to incorporate into project design. So, you know, get, you know, get your voice heard, you know, get out there, let us know what, you know, your thoughts, your concerns, your worries are, because these projects need to be built for all of our communities. And, you know, and so we can do that best by all being involved. As I mentioned, Atlantic Shores NJDEP hearing um, next Tuesday evening, check out the DEP website for information of that's in Bayville and they're having a virtual hearing on Wednesday. So uh, I will be there. Hope to see you and, uh, you know, get involved. Check out offshorewindpower.org for that public part participation guide. You can find out more on either how in New Jersey or federally you can be involved. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. Really appreciate it. Went a little bit over time there, but it was well worth the encore. A few extra questions at the end. So, uh, and that, if we were talking before, uh, Rolling Stones are happening right now or soon. In addition to the Mets, uh, so it's funny that you mentioned uh, Mick Jagger before. Oh, so. that's funny. I didn't even realize that. Well, definitely yeah. uh, go see Mick. Don't go see the Mets. <laughs> yeah, well, that's no. tonight at 8 and, and Sunday. So maybe somebody's listening on their way to at MSG or? MetLife. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you can maybe make it there from where you live. Maybe. I leave now. <laughs>